Good afternoon, I'm Saul Silverstein. I'm subbing for Vincent today because he's said enough. Um, today I'm going to talk about replication of DNA virus genomes. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the biochemistry of replication. Rather, I'm going to talk about some of the details of how these viruses use their own enzymes and the host enzymes and places in the cell that are advantageous for their own uh, replication. So, the most important thing that you need to know about DNA replication, or transcription for that matter, is that it's all about starting things off. What are the signals that are used to recognize polymerases? What host elements are required for this recognition process? What does the origin of DNA replication look like in many of these instances? And these are the problems that are faced by DNA replication machinery, both of the host and of the virus. Viruses, of course, have to replicate their genomes in order to produce new progeny. Without new progeny, we have nothing to study. Now, one of the um, elements that are important when you consider replication is, what do the various genomes look like? And here is a small sampling of the thousands and millions of kinds of viruses that we have. But we have here a parvovirus, which is a single-stranded DNA genome. And it comes in both plus and minus forms. But only one form is particular to each virion. So a virus particle contain, can contain a plus or a minus-stranded DNA. That creates problems for replication. Parvoviruses solve it in part by having terminal and inverted repeats, which allow the molecule to fold upon itself. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail later on. Herpes viruses, by and large, are large linear DNA molecules. And they, too, have inverted and terminal repeats. But they have unique origins for DNA replication. And for the case of herpes simplex virus, the one that's most commonly studied, there are three origins of replication, two of which are contained in repeated elements, ergo they are the same, and one that is present in the unique long region. The key feature of this origin, as for most origins that are DNA um, specific, is that they contain elements that allow base pairing. So a stem loop structure is formed that provides the origin in each of these cases. Polyomaviruses are circular, supercoiled molecules. So there are two um, strands of DNA that are interwoven and locked together to form a circle. And as a result of that, there are torsional energies that um, cause the molecule to twist. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. And the last virus genome that I'm going to talk about is the adenovirus. And here, the virus uses a protein molecule called terminal protein to initiate DNA replication. And we'll see how that works. Replication requires the expression of at least one virus protein in every system that we know about today. And what that tells you is that the virus genome has to be transcribed prior to the initiation of DNA replication. Some viruses encode many proteins. But in each instance that has been studied to date, no assembly of all known virus replication proteins is sufficient to elaborate DNA replication. There's always some contribution from the host. DNA is synthesized semi-conservatively semi in a five prime to three prime direction. And replication initiates at a defined origin using a primer. That primer can be RNA what's known as Okazaki fragments, DNA, as shown for the parvovirus, or, um, well, let's stay with the parvovirus, or a protein, as in the case of the adenovirus. And in all instances, the host provides other proteins. So what's the host for? Viruses just can't do it themselves. And we know that they're parasites. As a, as a parasite, it takes advantage of the milieu in which it exists. Whatever the host provides, either in the cytoplasm or in the nucleus, depending upon the kind of virus that it might be, it uses something that the host provides. They can be enzymes. 
and scaffolds. And by scaffolds, I mean places within the cell, either usually intranuclearly, that allow the DNA to attach, the incoming virus genome to attach, and form a series of complexes that engage virus and host proteins. Simple viruses conserve genetic information. And that's a hallmark of viruses in general. There are some exceptions. There are some very large ones which seem to be able to encode everything but exactly what they need. So they can't be independent organisms. The larger viruses contain many, or encode many, sometimes contain some, but not all proteins required for replication. So I think the take-home lesson from this is that they always hijack some host proteins. More if you're little and don't have a lot of coding information, less if you're big and have uh, quite a bit of it. Genomes come in a wide assortment of shapes and sizes, and that, of course, controls the accessibility uh, of host proteins and sites within uh, the cell. And replication yields progeny. And this is an important point, because progeny <coughs> make more virus, but replication is also a switch. And invariably, it's a dividing point in the virus life cycle between what are known as immediate early or early events, depending upon the virus, and later events. And the later events invariably are uh, designed to uh, produce capsid proteins, glycoproteins, things that are required to make an infectious virion. But the immediate early and early events are required to replicate the genome and perhaps change the transcriptional landscape of the virus genome. So DNA replication is always delayed after infection. It's not the first event. Rather, the virus must come into the cell, transcribe its genetic information. This encodes some proteins that are necessary to replicate that viral genome. What are the outcomes of DNA replication? The one that we talk about most often is the lytic infection. This is where the cell is blown apart by the virus, new progeny are made, and high copy numbers of genomes are produced. The other, and perhaps to me, more interesting facet is what's known as latent infections. Here, where viruses sequester themselves within their host, and they get assimilated, and in some cases, they replicate when the host cell replicates, and we'll talk about that uh, in a later lecture. In some cases, they just stay there in low copy number in non-dividing cells. These virus genomes may be episomal, just like a plasmid in a bacteria. So it's a circular molecule, coexists with the host, replicates with the chromosome most of the time. Sometimes it breaks out, and when it breaks out from that controlled replication cycle, it initiates a lytic infection most of the time. These episomal molecules are invariably <coughs> decorated with host chromatin, and so they look and feel, if you're a cell, like a chromosome. They can also be integrated. So these DNA molecules molecules can enter the chromosome and then be perpetuated with the cell as it divides. Sometimes the consequences of these are very interesting. In cases of some of the known tumor viruses, this leads to tumorigenesis. In the case of HIV, which starts out as an RNA virus, becomes a DNA virus, this leads to uh, efficient latency and escape from the host. What are the requirements for DNA replication? Most important one is the ability to recognize the origin of the virus, be that DNA or protein. Invariably, these initiation sites contain AT-rich DNA. Why? Because AT-rich DNA is able to be opened much more easily. So you can melt apart those strands of DNA, and the resulting single-stranded sequences can either form a particular structure, or they provide an entry site for a uh, protein which will help initiate, will recognize the origin and initiate DNA replication. Priming can result from, can use RNA, Okazaki fragments, and these are made by the DNA polymerase alpha. DNA itself, the hairpin, hairpin structures found in uh, parvoviruses, or proteins that are covalently attached to the five prime end of a growing DNA chain. The next step that we have to be concerned with is elongation, and that seems to be done rather routinely, and virus elongation rates are pretty much as they are in cells. 
And the final step is termination, and that depends upon the molecule. In a circular molecule, you realize if you have unidirectional DNA, you just go around the molecule. If you have bidirectional DNA, then growing replication forks meet at a common site, which is generally 180 degrees from the origin of DNA replication. So, what are some of the requirements for DNA replication? <coughs> Viruses don't replicate well in quiescent cells. So a cell at rest is not a good host for a virus. And that should be pretty obvious to you. Anybody know why? Don't raise your hands all at once. Okay. It's because you need the host DNA synthetic apparatus. And a cell at rest doesn't have that. This is what cell cycle regulation and checkpoints are all about. It's allowing the cell to go through a cycle of DNA replication and then putting those replication proteins aside for the next cycle or destroying them in some instances. So what does the virus do when it's really clever? It transcribes proteins that induce host replication enzymes and cell cycle regulators or sequesters cell cycle regulators. So what they are doing is co-opting the cell towards their own end and that end is to make new DNA. And again, the virus encoded immediate early and early gene products are the ones that are responsible invariably for induction of host replication. It would be clever if the virus were to package an enzyme like that or a protein like that, but to date, we don't know of any such uh, virus. So where do the polymerases come from? Small viruses, I told you before, do not encode these proteins. Rather, they will encode proteins that help um, to mobilize the host. And these viruses are the papillomaviridae, those that are responsible for the development of warts, the polyomaviridae, which are uh, tumor promoters in animals and also in uh, rare cases in human, and the parvoviridae, which cause a bunch of rather benign diseases, we believe. Large DNA viruses encode most of their own replication systems, and these are the herpes viruses, the adenoviridae, and the poxviridae. What are some of these proteins? Invariably, there are origin binding proteins. Why? Because you have to recognize your DNA above all and before that of the host. Many viruses encode helicases, the purpose of which, of course, is to open the DNA, melt it, make it accessible for these proteins to um, initiate DNA synthesis. And primases. Primases provide the um, landing site for the polymerase on which to build the DNA molecule. Viruses such as herpes viruses and adeno can um, encode their own DNA polymerases and they encode what we call accessory proteins. Accessory proteins are by and large proteins that help to make the polymerase more functional, more efficient, help it to bring the DNA synthesis to a, um, uh, a higher rate and in a much smoother fashion. They also frequently contain exonucleases, which are used to um, monitor the DNA and to make sure that the nucleotides that are put in place are the correct ones. And as you'll see when we get into detail, also to remove things such as the RNA primers that are used to initiate DNA replication. And frequently, viruses encode proteins that are involved in DNA uh, in deoxynucleotide triphosphate metabolism. Cells at rest don't have thymidine kinases, for example. So you want to bring thymidine in from the outside milieu, you need a kinase, a ribonucleotide reductase for removing uh, changing ribonucleotides, and a DUTPase to remove DUTP. So there are a wide variety of enzymes that are all well-known DNA synthesis um, enzymes that viruses will, can provide. So where does replication occur? For the most part, it's in the nucleus of the cell. The pox viruses do it differently, and they tend to do it in the cytoplasm. But for most of the viruses we're going to talk about today, replication occurs at replication centers. And these are a result of DNA templates getting together with replication proteins at discrete sites in the cell nucleus. These discrete sites actually are quite limited. And we believe there are no more than about 10. And that gave rise 
to the name nuclear domain tens. You'll pardon my voice, it tends to leave me. Nuclear domain tens are a scaffold, and they contain a large number of host proteins. Many of them are repair enzymes. Many of them are um, recombinases. Uh, many of them are the same things that the virus brings to the site. Polymerases, ligases, helicases, and topoisomerases, molecules that are very important for opening and closing DNA. So what do they look like? This is an immunofluorescent analysis of a cell before infection. This green stain stains for DNA. Now know what happens to the DNA post-infection. We see that there's a change in the morphology or in where in that nucleus the DNA goes. ICP8 happens to be a herpes virus single-strand DNA binding protein. It's of course not present before infection, but after infection we see that it accumulates in the nucleus. And by overlaying these two images, we see that they are indeed uh, in the same places. So the images merge, and we see the color change from green and red to yellow. And we say that ICP8 is in replication bodies where virus DNA is. So what is it about getting started that's so difficult? Well, first, you've got to have this site, the AT-rich region. And that's the viral origin. And we need viral origin recognition proteins, or the cell needs to provide something. And what happens when these proteins meet up with this AT-rich origin is that they see the assembly of multi-protein complexes. And we'll see just how many proteins there are, at least the ones that we know about. Some viruses, as I told you before, have a single origin. Others have up to three. And frequently, these multiple origin viruses use them for different purposes. So later on, we'll talk about Epstein-Barr virus, uh, a frequent uh, populator of mankind. And we'll talk about the difference between latent replication and lytic replication. And we'll see that there are two different origins of replication, and they're used at different times in the life cycle. And these origins of replication are frequently uh, associated with transcriptional control regions, things that modulate what genes are expressed that are adjacent to the origins. OK, we're back to our genomes. And we're going to talk about these guys. We're going to talk about how the three prime end of a single-stranded virus can serve as a primer for DNA. We'll talk about the problems that arise from that. We'll talk a lot about the polyomavirus replication because it's the one that is best understood. We'll then go on and speak about adenovirus replication and its interesting uh, five prime initiator, which is a protein. And finally, we'll end up with herpes virus in uh, a, brief, um, a brief tribute to a virus I worked on for 40 years. Okay, so the polyomaviruses have this problem. We depict them as a circle, okay? So we all see the circle. But in reality, what they are is supercoiled molecules. And what that means is they coil on themselves and they get like this. That's the middle part of the diagram. And then you go a little further and this hose is way too thick. And you see they begin to knot up on themselves. And that's just supercoil. So how do you find something? And how do you replicate this mess? Okay. So the trick is that most of the virus chromosome is covered with nucleosomes. But for some reason or another, the origin of DNA replication in SV40, what's called this core origin, is left naked. And once things are available or accessible, a DNA binding protein can recognize that site and begin to melt out the DNA. Now that has some interesting topological consequences, but the bottom line is that it allows free accessibility to the entire molecule. Not quite like that, but it allows things to go back and forth. So here are your prototypical origins, and you'll see that, for example, in herpes simplex virus, we have these inverted repeats, this guy here, this guy here, that guy there. And what they do is form a stem loop structure. That's one of the sites of our, the origins. And here's adenovirus. This is the end, very end of the molecule, so it only represents maybe uh, 50 base pairs. 
but it has a site where the, the adenovirus polymerase and the preterminal protein um, bind, and then a bunch of machinations happen, and we get a terminal protein out of that. So, what are some of these origin recognition proteins? All the polyomaviridae encode a protein called T antigen. Originally stood for transformation antigen or tumor antigen because bits and pieces of it were presented on the surface of tumor cells. Indeed, it's a rather large protein. It's 708 amino acids. Um, Carol Purvis in the biology department here has done some really elegant work on how this works and the biochemistry of this molecule. And I'm going to show you a little bit about uh, that in a bit. Papillomaviruses encode a DNA binding protein called E1, but it doesn't bind to the origin by itself. Rather, it requires the presence of another papillomavirus protein, E2. So E2 recognizes a site on virus <laughs> DNA, and E1, which is a single-strand binding protein and has helicase activity, binds to E2 and facilitates opening of the papillomavirus origin of DNA replication. Adeno-associated virus encodes a protein Rep6878, and this binds at the end and helps to unwind the DNA, and that's for initiation. It also plays a role in terminal resolution. Adenovirus encodes this pre-terminal protein, and that binds right opposite the three prime terminus, both three prime termini of a double-stranded DNA molecule, and it recruits DNA polymerase to the site, and we'll show you how that works. And herpes simplex virus encodes a protein called UL9, which is an origin binding protein. And this also recruits virus proteins to AT-rich origins. And this subsequently results in unwinding of DNA, accessibility of the site to polymerase. OK, just to remind you of where we're going, we're going to go from here to there to there. And we're not going to talk about pox viridae. But I just thought I'd present this to you because it's in your text and you might wonder why. And what this is is a large, very large double-stranded DNA molecule that's endless. So it has these terminal loops at each end and these internal uh, terminal repeats, inverted terminal repeats, and this whole thing is a big circle. And these inverted terminal repeats serve as the origins of replication for pox. Single-stranded uh, DNA gene ohms are a little bit different. We'll talk a little bit about the linear guys. We get both plus and minus strands, and both plus and minus strands are found in virions. <coughs> the circoviridae are single-stranded circular DNA molecules, and uh, there are now some evidence for how they replicate. I will not go into that because it's super complicated and unnecessary. And finally, we'll get on to these parvoviridae. So, there are two basic modes of replication. There is the natural replication fork, where the strands separate, and you have a fork here. And one strand is called leading strand synthesis that initiates off of an RNA primer, and the DNA is continuously extended. The other is called lagging strand synthesis. And just as the name implies, this occurs after the leading strand synthesis, not by a lot, but by a little bit. And the conundrum is that in order to do that, you have to start and extend your growing chain, but it's going in the wrong direction. So you're growing out to here and to here and to here because, uh, excuse me, you're going from here to here and from here to here, and the end result of that is you have pieces of DNA that have to be linked together in order to get a, a complete strand. Then there's strand displacement, which is what adenovirus does. It uses that protein primer and a protein called DNA binding protein and extends off of the template strand and displaces this strand. This displaced strand is subsequently used to synthesize the other strand. So you get semi-conservative replication <laughs> off of two independent templates. Okay, let's talk about polyomavirus replication forks. They initiate from that single origin. They require T antigen. They replicate bidirectionally as a covalently closed supercoiled molecule. So you have that big knot that I showed you before 
You start in one place and you go in both directions at once. You have two replication forks and you have four strands of DNA being replicated. Two leading and two lagging. And we'll show you that in more detail. The leading strands use an RNA primer, as does the lagging strand. But it doesn't start until the replication fork has moved because it needs a room. They also use RNA primers, and this creates those discontinuities. And we will address the question of how do you fill in the gaps. In order to look at this in more detail, we need to know something about T antigen. And one of the most interesting things is that it's a species-specific DNA binding protein. That means that the T antigen from man, the human polyomaviruses, will not function in a murine cell, and <coughs> vice versa. The reason for that is that pre-initiation complexes don't form in the wrong species. So even though the DNA binding proteins can recognize the origin with some affinity, because the origins are reasonably conserved, they fail to interact with the local DNA alpha polymerase and can't initiate. This protein also binds and sequesters cell cycle regulators. So very important proteins for cell cycle regulation, such as um, the retinoblastoma gene product and uh, PML and P53 are bound by this protein. And the reason for that is that once you interact with these proteins, you remove them from regulating post-replication um, synthesis. And this causes cells to enter into S phase. And the question is why, but the answer is very simple, because the virus needs all of the protein products that are provided by the host. T antigen synthesis is auto-regulated. That means it controls its own um, expression. When you make a lot of it, you shut down transcription of that gene in favor of other gene products. The protein itself is heavily modified. That is, it's decorated, and think of it like a Christmas tree. It has a lot of different ornaments on it. And these ornaments can be phosphorylation molecules. They can be uh, ADP ribosylation molecules um, and other things. And it's this modification that controls its ability to bind DNA, and it promotes cooperativity of the T antigen. And T antigen works as a hexamer. So six units of T antigen uh, bind together, and they encircle the area around the origin of DNA. And it does this in tandem, one for each replication fork. T antigen also can affect the unwinding of DNA because it has helicase activity. So here's a schematic of the T antigen molecule. And the things that you'll note is that it has domains that interact with polymerase alpha and a protein such as P53. It has ATPase activity. It has a helicase activity. It has a single-stranded binding domain. It has an origin DNA binding domain. It interacts with the retinoblastoma virus protein. And again, another domain that interacts with Pol alpha. And at the very end is this host range protein, which controls um, how it works in different cell types. So I don't think you need to know all these things, but I do think you need to know that it's a multifunctional protein. And what the virus has done is taken all of the attributes that many other proteins distribute amongst many proteins and put it into one. The core sequence is a sequence of DNA elements that form a palindrome, and they're between an early and a late promoter. And so they are obvious points for regulation of early and late gene expression. The large T antigen binding sites are contained right around these regions. And you can see there's one here, and there's another one down here. The origin sequence is HT rich and nucleosome free. Nucleosome free to allow for accessibility. OK, so now we have our covalently closed circular double-stranded DNA molecule represented as a linear molecule for the sake of sanity. And we're going to talk about um, initiation at the origin and bidirectional replication, meaning going in this direction and that, and the fact that we have two replication forks 
and we have two leading strands where DNA synthesis is continuous and two lagging strands where DNA synthesis is discontinuous. So, the important thing to recognize uh, besides the continuity and the discontinuity is that direction of synthesis off of either template strand is the same. You're always going five prime to three prime, whether you're making it continuously or you're making it at the replication fork as the lagging strand does and discontinuously. So what happens? We have this large T antigen binding site right adjacent to our AT rich palindrome. And large T in the presence of ATP forms these hexameric units and two of these bind at the site of the origin. As a result of binding, what happens is the DNA is conformationally altered. Remember that this has some helicase activity. And it changes um, <clears throat> the early promoter sequence or the early palindrome and it gets extruded from the T antigen molecule. So you now have something that's readily accessible. And it's readily accessible to a host protein called replication protein A, which in the presence of ATP will recognize that DNA and bind to it. Now you have a coated molecule in an area that was once free. The coated molecule <coughs> now, I'm sorry, excuse me. And now we have this open um, origin of replication and topoisomerase 1 recognizes uh, the covered DNA and topo is important because topo nicks DNA and allows it to unwind. It's a nicking closing enzyme. So it opens DNA and it closes it. It grabs both ends of the DNA, passes one end under the other and then closes it back up. Now this origin of DNA replication is at a unique position on the virus chromosome and how do we know that? Well. Within the virus DNA, there are restriction endonuclease sites, enzymes that cut DNA at specific sequences. And many of them are present only once in the DNA genome. And they are asymmetric. That is, they're not in the middle. They're off to one side. When you cut DNA as a result of that, if the origin is in a unique site, then the distance to each end will be different. So the origin is asymmetrically located. And here's a replicating DNA molecule that has been cut. And you can see that there's a little bubble where the DNA has initiated its synthesis. And you'll note that there's a short arm and a long arm. And as the DNA replication fork moves, we ask the question, does it move in one direction or two? If it moves in one direction, one arm and one arm only will get shorter if it's unique. If it moves in both directions, then both arms will get shorter as it moves in, those, uh, in that order. And you can see that as the replicating DNA expands, or as DNA is replicated, the short arm and the long arm both get shorter until at some point, of course, you'll cross the restriction endonuclease site and you'll have a forked end. So that's how we know that replication is bidirectional. Now, what's the problem? This is the problem. It's real easy to understand leading strand synthesis. But lagging strand synthesis is more difficult because it requires that you make DNA in the same direction because you're coming off of, let's say, this strand. And what you do is you have an RNA initiator, which is a result of a primase and alpha polymerase, and you start here. And then you synthesize your DNA down there. And you go back up here and you do that again. And how did this occur? Well, it occurs through a very interesting and complicated machine that we'll see in a couple of minutes. But more importantly, you're left with these gaps and you have to fill them. And what you do for the most part is you remove the ribonucleotides and you do that with specific exonucleases that are host associated. And then you synthesize DNA to fill in the gap and you seal it all up and then you get a continuous strand. So, leading strand is easy. There's a presynthesis complex, which is composed of host polymerase alpha, T antigen, and RPA. Then replication factor C binds at the three prime end of the DNA, along with proliferating cell nuclear antigen and polymerase delta. And 
Each of these proteins serves a specific purpose. Replication factor C is a clamp-loading protein. The clamp that it loads is proliferating cell nuclear antigen, and this causes the release of polymerase alpha, which provides the RNA in the Okazaki fragments. They form sliding clamps along the DNA, and they continuously copy parental strand. Lagging strand is not so easy. First, we have these primers, these RNA Okazaki fragments, or the Okazaki fragments, which are RNA plus DNA, and they're made by the pole alpha primase complex. And they're short because they can only run up to the replication fork or the last uh, piece of DNA. DNA is copied from the replication fork towards the origin. Seems to be backwards, but indeed it's going in the right direction. As a consequence, multiple initiations are required to replicate the template strand. Both leading and lagging strands move in the same direction, on the same strand, and which moves the DNA or the complex. And we have every uh, bit of evidence to believe that it's the DNA that moves. So you form a complex, and the DNA gets threaded through it. These are the players that I've listed, and they contact various um, host and viral proteins, and these are the functions that they provide to the replication of uh, the SV40 molecule. So let's look at it in some detail. Here's our open origin complex from that last slide. We add polymerase alpha and primase, deoxynucleotide triphosphates, and nucleotide triphosphates to make the RNA and the ensuing DNA. This leads to easy synthesis on the leading strand from the origin and from the origin in this direction. And then um, RFC, replication factor C, that clamp, PCNA and ATP, are drawn to the molecule. And replication factor C binds the three prime end of the RNA-DNA hybrid, the, uh, the Okazaki. It's not really a hybrid, but the hybrid molecule the Okazaki fragment, and then PCNA comes in. The same thing happens on the lagging strand, but in multiple, uh, with multiple events. Once PCNA is there, alpha polymerase is kicked out, and delta polymerase comes in. And delta polymerase is the one that continues synthesis in uh, uh, both strands. And then finally, you get to the point where you have to connect these um, <coughs> various strands and we synthesize them with pole delta on both the leading and the lagging strand. And then we use RNase H and FEN1. These are two nucleases that remove RNA nucleotides. Pole delta synthesizes new DNA, and DNA ligase seals the gap. So we remove the RNA, we fill the gaps, and we seal, and that way we get to uh, continuous molecules. This is summarized for those of you who have the book. This is the um, diagram from the book. The only thing it leaves out is this last little step where polymerase delta is required to seal uh, the gaps. <coughs> now, what does a DNA machine look like? Well, this is actually uh, an interesting problem. Here we're looking at one replication fork, and this is the parental DNA with both strands. One strand comes out through um, the T antigen site, and this is the leading strand where DNA is made continuously. The other strand, which is the lagging strand, is looped out as a single strand of DNA, and all of the various proteins engage this, but they engage it at sites that are upstream of the fork, and they synthesize backwards. Well, what seems to be backwards, 5 prime, 3 prime, but they synthesize in small pieces so that they only cover a small area. So this is a picture of what's going on. And what you see here is that the parental DNA is being extruded through the T, t antigen domain, and the leading strand DNA gets synthesized continuously. But for the lagging strand, it gets looped out, and then RNA primers are put on, and then it comes back. And this enables that long lagging strand to be made discontinuously. This is a tremendously 
um, energy demanding uh, event, and it requires the action of many, many proteins. So what are the problems in replication? The first problem is this covalently closed molecule. And what happens as a result of binding of virus uh, proteins is that the DNA gets opened. It gets unwound at the top, and once something is unwound at the top, it's overwound at the bottom. And topoisomerases release the torsional stress on these molecules. They open and close them, and they result in what's called a relaxed supercoil. There's a nick that allows things to move across. These topoisomerases are also required to separate the parental and daughter strands from each other because when you replicate a covalently closed molecule, you get this crazy structure where the DNA uh, strands are intertwined, and these are called catenated molecules. Topoisomerase nicks the strands and allows the two strands to separate and closes them back up. It's not the two strands, but the two genomes to separate and closes them back up. How about termination? There are separate daughter molecules from the replication complex. The topos relax and unwind the supercoils. This unwinding leads to overwinding throughout the rest of the molecule. And in the end, when you have two molecules, topo decatenates. It separates the daughter molecules by cleaving and resealing the replicated molecules. Termination occurs at a site that's, as I told you before, 180 degrees around from the origin of DNA replication, and there's no specificity to that site. You can delete the nucleotides at that site. You can add nucleotides at that site. It just stops when the two replication forks meet. Now we're on to our parvovirus. And this is priming via a specialized structure, and the specialized structure is the tail end of the DNA itself. So parvoviruses self-prime, and they form a template primer. That is, they are both the template for DNA synthesis and the primer. Their genome DNAs are single-stranded, of both plus and minus polarity, and they contain this inverted terminal repeat, and that's what allows for the special structure that's used to initiate DNA synthesis. So you start here, but how do you get to the end? If you copy from this point, you recognize the fact that you're not copying any of this. That's, that's something for you to think about, uh, but we won't go into it in any great detail. Um, these are called dependoviruses because they express no DNA polymerases. They use that ITR to self-prime. They require the host polymerase delta, RFC and PCNA, just like the poly polyomavirus <coughs> replication. But where they differ is they have a protein called Rep7868 that I told you about before. And this, these two proteins are required for initiation and resolution. So they both are important for recognizing the site to start DNA and to separate the strands at the end because only one of the two strands goes into new virus particles. There's no replication fork in replication of an AAV because only one strand is being replicated. Now, what about adenoviruses? Adenoviruses replicate by strand displacement synthesis. So one strand is pushed off while the other strand is being replicated. They utilize a, a protein primer. Because they use strand displacement, they have origins at both ends of the molecule, and they do that because they have inverted terminal repeats. The sequence that's present at one end is present at the other end. And yet they manage to semi-conservatively replicate DNA because they do it from different replication forks. <coughs> protein priming is initiated by a protein called the precursor to terminal protein, PTP. And what happens is PTP recognizes a site on the adenovirus DNA molecule, and it brings in the adenovirus DNA polymerase. So for these things to occur, adenovirus has to begin its transcriptional program. It has to elaborate its early proteins. It has to synthesize these two molecules that are virus encoded. The adenovirus DNA polymerase links an alpha phosphoryl of deoxycytidine monophosphate 
to a free hydroxy in serine residue in PTP. So now you have PTP with a serine that has a deoxycytidine moiety linked to it. And that's enough because it has a free 3' prime hydroxyl to initiate DNA synthesis. This thing is only added, that is, the de deoxycytidine uh, monophosphate is only added when the protein primer is assembled with the polymerase into a pre-initiation complex. So like everything else, you've got to have something that begins the process, opening the DNA, finding a landing site, docking, um, putting a primer uh, that's accessible to polymerase. And it's that, whoops, that three prime hydroxy, that prime synthesis of the daughter strand. Now let's look at this schematically. Here's our adenovirus molecule. It's two strands of DNA, plus and minus, if you will, left and right, Watson and Crick, 35,000 nucleotides long. It enters the cell, it undergoes limited transcription, and PTP is made. PTP recognizes a site at the end of the three prime end of the virus DNA molecule. It docks there and it acts as a sink to bring polymerase to that site. Once these two things are together, a serine in PTP acts as a site for addition of CMP and now you have a cytidine with a free three prime hydroxyl which can be used to extend. So how does that work? Here we have these two molecules with the cytidine, uh, the deoxycytidine at its end, bound to or hybridized to this G, the terminal G, and DBP, DNA binding protein, an adenovirus specified protein, recognizes this pre-initiation complex and the DNA that is extended. So the DNA that's not being replicated begins, because it's single-stranded, begins to get coated with DBP. And then it, as more DBP um, comes in, and as the DNA is extended by the polymerase in a processive fashion, that strand begins to get displaced until it is a free strand. But because it contains inverted terminal repeats, they can bind to each other again. And that single-stranded DNA template can now serve for the initiation of a new strand of DNA synthesis, just as it did above. The strand that's being synthesized here is finally completed, and now you have a double-stranded molecule from this strand, and you have a double-stranded molecule that's made from that strand. So semi-conservative replication <coughs> in a rather ingenious fashion. Herpes virus, and here I'm, today I'm going to talk about herpes simplex virus and none of the others. HSV, as I told you before, has two origins that can be found in what's called uh, the unique short region. And this is a schematic of the viral chromosome. And you'll see below it that this viral chromosome, when um, analyzed in depth, is actually found to be present as four isomers. And the isomers result from a molecular swivel around where the unique short region meets the unique long region. And what you see is that these can invert relative to one another so that you can have, <coughs> <coughs> you can have uh, this region turning on itself, so it goes from H to L to L to H. You can have the long region going from J to F, now going from F to J, or both of these can um, invert you realize that the only possible consequence of this, or the only way this would affect the virus genetically, is if there was a gene that went across the junction between the inverted long and the inverted short region. Whoops, I'm sorry. So there are four equimolar isomers of the virus genome. DNA enters the cell as a linear molecule, so the virus genome, when isolated from virions, those infectious particles that Dr. Racaniello talks about, is a linear molecule. As soon as it enters the cell, the virus is, con as soon as it enters the nucleus, excuse me, the linear molecule appears to be converted to a circle. And these circular DNA molecules then populate 
host ND10s, those nuclear domain 10s. And there are about uh, 10 of these, and so you can replicate 10 molecules at once, but from any one molecule you can make hundreds of copies. And the virus DNA replicates as a rolling circle, and we'll show you briefly what that is. So how does herpes virus DNA replication initiate? The virus DNA comes in as that linear molecule, then it circularizes, it uses a host enzyme, DNA ligase 4, and another protein called XRCC4. And now you have these circular molecules. And these circular molecules are then transcribed, just as we talked about for SV40. And virus immediate early proteins are made, and virus early proteins are made. And the virus early proteins encode a plethora of enzymes that are important for replication of virus DNA. Among them is an origin binding protein. So here are the seven virus proteins that are known to be involved in DNA replication. Three of them um, interact with one another to form a primase compl complex. One, UL42, is a processivity factor for the DNA polymerase. polymerase. UL9 is an origin binding protein, recognizes the origin of binding. It recognizes both that single origin in the unique long region and the two origins that are identical in the unique short region. And there's a single-stranded binding protein. So everything is pretty much as you saw it before, except, <coughs> and we'll get to that exception in a second. So here we have our stem loop structure that's recognized by OBP, origin binding protein. Second step is um, the accessibility of open DNA to the single-stranded binding protein, keeps the strands apart. Then the helicase primase um, complex moves in at the replication fork and allows for accessibility of HSV DNA polymerase and its processivity factor to make leading and lagging strands to replicate the DNA. Now as a closed circular molecule, it could replicate just like SV40 or the polyomavirus that we talked about before, but it doesn't. It replicates initially as a rolling circle. And what does that mean? That means it nicks the DNA somewhere and it removes that strand or it takes that strand out. So it's got one strand where it is copying continuously. This reminds you a little bit of adenovirus, except it's doing it as a single molecule and not spitting the displaced strand off. And then it displaces this strand, and this strand gets synthesized discontinuously. The end result of that in this rolling circle model is that you get head to tail um, concatamers of DNA. One genome length molecule covalently bound to another DNA uh, genome length molecule and on and on and on and these can become quite endless if you will. And contained within the junctions of these two genomes are cleavage packaging sites. So proteins of the virus recognize those sites where the two um, genomes join and cleave them to, uh, to generate uh, unique genomes that are packaged at the same time. So thank you.